Morning, everyone. Thank you, Jerry. Um, it's great to be here to start this conference to talk about China. China is really important to us here in Australia. I want you to think back seven years, not very really long ago, 2007. I'm sure you can all remember what you were doing in 2007. In the last seven years, China's economy has doubled, just in that seven-year period. It's going to probably double again in the next 10 years, and probably double again in the 10 years after that. So in 20 years' time, China's economy will be four times the size it is today. And it's already a big economy. It's the second largest economy in the world. And it's already having a big impact in Australia. Just think about what a four times China is going to do to our property prices, uh, our investment scenario, even beef prices over the next 20 years. What a great opportunity you all have to live in this Asian century. And I want to flag for you the importance of this current five-year plan in China. Um, the five-year plan is a, uh, a document that the Chinese government put together. Um, the Chinese government is unusual because it starts with a plan. And not only does it have a plan, it has a five-year plan. And if you look back over the 11 five-year plans that China's been through, you'll see that they meet pretty much every target and milestone and goal that they set. So it actually makes our life really easy when we try and predict what's going to happen in China because they've already told us. It's in the five-year plan. So you've all read the five-year plan, haven't you? Yeah? You haven't read the five-year plan. OK, well, let me give you a quick summary of what's in the five-year plan because it's really important that you understand that China is changing, and it's changing very, very quickly. The last 30 years has been all about growth at any cost, just double-digit growth, getting people out of rural areas into urban centers, creating income, creating jobs, creating wealth, creating productivity. That's been done at any cost, any cost to the environment, any cost to the political situation. And in this current five-year plan, they've decided to change the nature of that growth. And it's now all about quality, the quality of that growth over the next 30 years. So this is actually a game changer for us because it changes the nature in which China is growing. So it's really important that we pay attention now because in this five-year plan, they've set three key priorities and they're important for all of us. So let me point out what they are. They're very simple. Going out, going west, and going green. Let me talk about each of those in turn. Um, here's a map of the world that uh, I grew up with. You probably gather I'm a POM. Um, in fact, I've seen maps of the world where Australia was left off or there was a sticker over it because it was sort of out of the way. Now, that's all changed. As you know, we're now living in the middle of the region that really matters. We're to our north, uh, India and China and Russia, to our east, Brazil, these four BRIC countries, these big, rapidly industrializing countries, so important for us here in Australia. And we're right in the middle now of the region that really matters. And when you look at China going out, which is all about taking investment out of the domestic economy, where it's been largely uh, invested in US Treasury bonds and the US dollar, into real corporate assets around the world. When you look at how China's doing that, you see a picture that starts to look like this. Now, every dot on this map represents a deal, an outbound investment deal, done by China in the last five years in one sector. Now, you all know what that sector is. Yeah? the mining and resources sector, one sector. Now, when you look at that map, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? This is China going out, investing overseas in real corporate assets, in other countries, in different currencies, getting to understand how different markets work by investing in mining and resources because they've had one clear priority for the last 30 years, which is energy security for a billion people. Now, they're just moving now, and it's moved actually quite quickly to their next strategic imperative, which, of course, is food security. And it wouldn't surprise me if we came back here in 10 years' time and we put a map up and showed how China is investing overseas in this next sector, the food and agriculture sector, if we didn't see a picture a bit like this as well. Now, when you look at this picture, and this is the mining and resources sector, you can see that Australia is not the only source of products in this area. But we're pretty significant. 
When you look at it, there's pretty, quite a lot of dots uh, on Australia. And if you, if you look at the investment in terms of China going out, Australia is still the number one offshore destination for Chinese outbound investment. That's very significant for all of us, not because it's been yet invested into this sector, but because the Chinese have learned a lot about investing in Australia. They've learned about our quirky parliament. They've learned about our foreign investment rules and regime. They've learned how Australians do business. And it puts us in a really strong position going forward in terms of how that future investment will start to flow. Now, of course, we're not interested in the mining resources sector particularly. We've had that boom. We're now interested in the next big boom, which is food and agriculture. So it's quite interesting to start thinking about where China will invest next. Now, where would you find the answer to that, do you think? The five-year plan? Yep. You were paying attention earlier. Good. Because that is exactly where you can find out where China is going to invest next, because they've already told us. And as Jerry said, I sit on the board of the Australia-China Business Council, and we regularly receive delegations from China, and they always show us their shopping list in terms of what they're interested in, and it always used to have iron ore and coal at the top. Now it looks like this. And this is because these are the sectors identified in the five-year plan for future outbound investment. And of course, top of that list is the food, agriculture, dairy sector, because this is their next key priority. Uh, in terms of outbound investment. So when you look at the drivers of this uh, investment, there, is, there are a number of factors. The first is security of supply. As I said, energy security was the big one. Now, whilst they still have that issue, they're moving towards food security. A big issue, I'll come back to that in a moment. They're also trying to diversify because they have this huge uh, overextension in terms of the US dollar. Not such a smart investment as it turned out. Now they want to invest and diversify overseas into new countries, new currencies, and new corporate assets. Migration actually is a big driver. We're starting to see a large number of high net worth individuals looking to migrate from China around the world, and a lot of them are coming to Australia. They bring a lot of investment with them. Um, and we're starting to see that having an impact, particularly at the smaller end, perhaps, if not yet at the bigger end. There's also a growth issue. If you're a Chinese company in the local domestic market, you've enjoyed double-digit growth for the last 10 or 20 or 30 years. You won't get double-digit growth in the future as China slows to a more manageable growth rate. So to get that growth, you have to invest overseas into corporate assets and get access to global customers. And then finally, the other driver is actually around influence. China now has a lot of influence globally. Uh, as a member of the G20, are starting to influence the uh, BRICS, the, who meet quite regularly. And now, of course, when they go to places like the US, the red carpet is rolled out for them. It didn't used to be like that. China has experienced 200 years of humiliation and shame, which they're now coming out of. And they're starting to show that impact globally now. And we're going to see a lot more of China's influence in the future as they seek to go out which is the major first priority in this current five-year plan. Now, does anybody know this city? Anyone here from Brisbane? Put your hand up if you're from Brisbane. Nobody here from Brisbane. Oh, one or two. So you'll know this city because it's the sister city of Brisbane. It's not Shanghai, but it is a Chinese city. It's the Chinese city of Chongqing, a population of 30 million people in western China. The sister city of Brisbane, which is why I pointed out to our friends from Brisbane, I think quite a big opportunity there, but let's not get bogged down by that. Um, Chongqing is a really important part of China's Go West strategy, which is all about moving investment and economic activity from the southern and eastern coastline inland into the inner western region. This region that uh, is in the middle of this red circle this, in this circle are, are some of the second tier cities of Chongqing, 30 million people. Chengdu, 22 million people. So that's 52 million people in those two cities right on the Yangtze River. And to the north, Lanzhou, Xi'an, uh, Wuhan, there's cities like Changsha and others in this inner western area, which is all part of their going west. And of course, we all talk about China's slowing growth rate. 
And indeed, there is a bit of slowing, particularly in some of the first tier cities, and that's deliberate because these cities are moving from being rapidly developing to becoming a lot more mature and looking to grow at a much more stable and more Western-type growth rate. But when you look at their second tier cities, like Shenyang in the north, and in this Western region, Xi'an, Chengdu, Chongqing, growing at double-digit type rates of growth. Chongqing, population of 30 million, growing at 16% a year. I don't think there's much slowing going on. So we're perhaps focusing on the wrong things when we look at China's growth rate. We should be looking behind that at what's happening behind the scenes. I was actually in Shenyang um, only a few months ago. The population of Shenyang today, which is up in the north there, is about 8 million. By the end of this decade, which is only six years away, it's going to be 20 million. And wherever you go in Shenyang, you see greenfield sites which are going to be turned into cities with skyscrapers. I'm not talking about townhouses and golf courses. We're talking about cities the size of Sydney, um, the size of Shanghai, will be built in the next six years. I don't see any sign of slowing in that part of China. But of course, we fixate on this one growth rate, the, the, the one number that they produce rapidly at the end of each quarter. But actually, again, there's no surprises in that number. They've already told us what their growth rate is going to be. It's in the five-year plan. And they've already told us it will be 7.6%. So I don't think we need to worry quite so much about slowing. I think what we need to do is to start rapidly looking at how we can distribute products and expertise and capability into these regional inner western areas, these second tier cities, which actually is where much of the agricultural activity uh, takes place. That's, go that's going west. And then the last uh, thing, which I don't want to spend a lot of time, is that China is actually going green very rapidly. It will take a long time. Industrial revolutions are no fun. If you've read the works of Charles Dickens, you know that Britain wasn't a particularly lovely place in the 1800s. Industrial revolutions take time, they create uh, dislocation, um, they create challenges and problems. And China is now starting to deal with that by spending big time on green energy, on new renewable sources of energy, and by starting to clean up their environment. Um, in Sydney, the uh, Sydney mayor, Clover Moore, was in China recently. I spent a bit of time with her. And she was absolutely amazed at how Chinese cities are transforming very quickly into green cities. She's very proud of what Sydney's doing in the green space. She said that China is way ahead of where Australia is because they're already exceeding some of the numbers on this slide. And they're, they're actually starting to become a global leader in terms of going green. And that's the third part of their five-year plan. So rather than spend a lot of time on it, I do urge you to think about this five-year plan and how you can take advantage of these three areas. Going out, which is about outbound investment, and looking to take opportunities there. Going west, which is about looking for opportunities in these inner western new second tier cities, which are emerging very quickly. And going green, where China is actually leading the world. I think you'll find there are opportunities across the board if you start following what the government is saying in those three areas. But I want to spend some time talking about where I see opportunities for this industry. Um, I'm not an economist um, or a politician or um, any of those things. I'm, I'm a business guy. I do deals. I work with Chinese entrepreneurs and investors and business leaders trying to do things in Australia. And I work with Australian companies in China. I work across many industries. Um, and I see opportunity in many different areas. So I want to um, show you a few and see, see whether some of them resonate, and then hopefully we'll have a bit of time for some questions. The first one is about Chinese investment in Australia. This is the big one. This is all part of the going out strategy. This is a photograph of a deal I'm doing in the Hunter Valley, actually, in, in New South Wales, where we have a very wealthy Chinese group looking to do a major tourism infrastructure resort in the Hunter. And this was an example of uh, one of the meetings we had up there. But this is the big one for this industry. China brings huge investment opportunity, billions of investments. This free trade agreement that we hope to have with China by the end of the year will be all about giving us better market access, which is good, but it will also be all about China investing in food security. We're going to have to manage billions of dollars of investment into our agricultural sector. And as I look around the room, 
I see a fairly fragmented industry, and I wonder how we could absorb a few billion dollars. And that's our challenge. We have to get smart. This isn't about selling the land. It's about working with the Chinese with co-investment. So the Chinese, they bring capital, and they bring a huge and fast-growing market. We bring land, we bring product, and we bring expertise. What a fantastic opportunity for us to grow our agricultural sector, not to mention our nation, uh, into the next 20 or 30 years, where Australia can boom in the agriculture and resources space. And it's all about us tapping into this wave of Chinese investment coming to Australia and being really smart about how we manage that. And I would say that that's probably our biggest challenge, uh, to figure out how we can not just absorb it, but make it work for us so that we can feed hundreds of millions of people in this region, as we're going to have to do, or as we have the opportunity uh, to do. So I, I say that is the big opportunity. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be talking a lot about it over the next couple of days. The next one, of course, is investment in food security. So whilst this investment is going to go across the board into many sectors, and there are other big sectors like healthcare, tourism, education, where we'll start to see major investment from China, the big one is into food security. Now, 73% of Shanghai residents in a recent survey said that the local food in China was either unsafe or very unsafe. 73%. Can you imagine what it's like living in an environment like that? Where you have to go to the supermarket and check every label carefully to find out where this food came from. We're so lucky in Australia, we don't even think about where the food comes from. 73% in Shanghai, which is one of their most modern cities, where a lot of the, a lot of the wealth is. So of course, I always say, it's one th if you're a rich person, it's one thing buying a Prada handbag or a BMW and showing that off, but it's another thing when you're spending money on food that you're going to put in your mouth. And not just your mouth, but your precious one child's mouth. Even more important. So you will spend whatever it takes to get access to the highest quality product. And your product, the premium beef from Australia, is the most high quality product that they think about. It's the next Prada handbag. That's what they'll spend their money on because it's really important to them that they get access to safe, reliable, sustainable, quality food from a country like Australia where they have a lot of faith in our local industry, as they should. So we're going to see a lot of investment in that space. And that, again, is going to be the big opportunity for all of you. And when we look at the volume of imported products into China, you'll see it from this slide that most of that growth comes in the meat area. The, 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 you perhaps can't see this very well. The meats, the veggies and fruits, the oil and seeds and fruits. This is where the big growth is going to come from. Last year, I led a mission of citrus growers to China, um, our orange farmers um, from all over Australia. Uh, most of them had never been outside regional Australia before, so when we arrived in Beijing, it was a bit of a culture shock for some of them. Um, and we spent a lot of time looking at the citrus opportunity in China, which is one of the big uh, growth areas. Three years ago, the citrus growers were digging up orchards. They, there wasn't, they, they were reducing their pr productivity, not increasing it. But in the last two or three years, China's come on stream for citrus. Major uh, growth there. And as I said, we had our 23 citrus growers who were looking for opportunities in the China space, and they were overwhelmed by the demand and the opportunity. In Australia, we produce about 350,000 tons of oranges every year. We consume about a third, we juice about a third, and we export about a third. And of that third that we export, a fairly small percentage goes to China. And as you can see, that percentage is just starting to grow a little bit but not very much. I think it's up to about 8,000 tons, which is tiny compared to the 350,000. So we laid some of these numbers down in front of the Chinese importers, and they said, well, we want the whole 350,000. In fact, we'd like double that. Can't you grow your trees a bit faster? Can't you, how are you going to double production? We've got the money. We'll invest in the supply chain. How do you double your production? Because that's what we need. Now, in China, they produce well over a million tons of citrus. But it comes from this polluted source, which, of course, is why they worry about it. 
So an Australian orange from a, from a well-organized, well-regulated industry is of high priority for them. But they can't get enough of it. And they want more. And they'll, and they'll invest. And there'll be the same challenge for some of you guys because the demand is growing very, very fast. And we have to now keep up with it. And uh, we've got some significant challenges in the citrus industry to do that. There's about 3,500 citrus growers in Australia. 3,500. That means there's a lot of people growing two or three trees. Um, we need to get consolidation in that industry. We need to aggregate. We need to work together. And what was interesting, I thought, about the citrus growers is that when they went to China, on the, we were there for 10 days. We went to three cities, Beijing, Shanghai, and uh, Guangzhou. On the first day, they were all looking at each other competing. By the end of the trip, they realized, actually, that it was a lot better if they worked as a group because the demand was far beyond anyone's capability in terms of supply. They had to work together. And now they've formed little collaboratives and cooperatives. They're now trying to build platforms. They're trying to welcome investment into those cooperatives so that they can grow their market in China. You guys are all going to have to do the same, I think. The next opportunity, I mentioned it, is migration. This is my friend, Mr. Chen, from a place called Zhuhai. And I, um, I'm his uh, foreigner in uh, Australia. I look after his interests here. I'm now the vice president of the Australia Zhuhai Business Association. This was the launch. He's a great example of a business migrant who brought his whole family here. His kids went to university here. He's building a city in Zhuhai the size of Sydney. And he's, bringing, he's building um, five-story uh, apartment blocks all over New South Wales. Great opportunity for us to work with migrants who bring investment, they bring expertise, connections, they bring language skills, they bring, they bring uh, uh, money. And we can tap into this vast number of high net worth migrants looking to find a new home around the world. There's a billion people in China. It's a crowded, polluted place. Australia is a big country to them. They see great opportunity to move here and enjoy the sort of lifestyle that we all enjoy. And of course, who can blame them? We need to welcome them, we need to work with them, we need to teach them, and we need to help get them to help open doors for us uh, in China. And I think that's going to be a big wave uh, over the next few years too. Um, the next one is around branding and marketing. I think this is incredibly important. This is a photograph that I took at a high-end premium supermarket chain in Shanghai, which shows um, oranges, citrus, um, on the shop floor in China. This is in a premium supermarket store. I'm not talking about the wet markets. I'm talking about the premium markets. And the point I'm trying to make is that when the Chinese look at an Australian orange, they don't actually care what the brand is. They don't care who made it. They don't care what brand or color or, or uh, what, what kind of special nature you, you have around your product. They care about only one thing. Does it come from Australia? And I think we have to get a lot better at promoting the Australia brand. I know that's quite controversial. And let me tell you, I had so many arguments with the citrus growers about this who told me that their grandfathers would turn in their grave if they ever used the Made in Australia sticker. But after a while, I'm happy to say we did actually persuade them to do that. Because the Chinese and the Asians need to know this comes from Australia. That is the number one primary brand. Now, of course, as they become more sophisticated in future, then, of course, we may be able to compete on a brand uh, and, a, and by developing your own value proposition. But for now, it's all about Team Australia. And I think we have to, be, we have to just give in to that for now and be consistent around branding and marketing and deliver that safe, quality, tasty message that we need to to get recognized in China. And I'm happy to say that the citrus growers have now been persuaded to all put this uh, sticker on their orange, despite what that might do to their relatives, aging and uh, past gone relatives. Very important. Um, the other point I want to make is around the renminbi. Now, the internationalization of the renminbi is a global mega trend. Now, China says that they want the renminbi to become an international reserve currency. Now, some people laugh at that and say, well, that's clearly ridiculous. But I have to say that when the Chinese say they're going to do something, it normally happens. And whilst they've still got a long way to go before the renminbi is even fully convertible, they're on that path and they're moving very quickly. Now, we trade with China 
often in a different currency. For example, in citrus, we grow oranges in an Australian dollar base, we sell them to China in a renminbi base, and we price the product in US dollars. So both sides of that transaction have to make a hedge or take some risk around the currency movements. It's not difficult now to trade in renminbi. And by doing that, not only will you be able to get a better deal, because you won't have to factor in that kind of buffer for the currency movements, but you will also be part of a growing movement which is around the internationalization of the renminbi, which is a global mega trend. It just hasn't quite hit us yet here in Australia. Now, I'm sure Patrick will be talking about this in a moment. It's not difficult now to turn up to your local bank and talk to them about trading with China in renminbi, collecting money in renminbi, invoicing in renminbi. And you should all do that if you're dealing with China. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that a bit later. Um, I think this is the big one. We often talk about becoming the food bowl of Asia. Um, I, I think that's a difficult job for us. You know, there's a few billion people in Asia in that sort of rapidly growing middle class. We want the premium consumer, the rich people. That's what we want. Now, Lauren Zhao is a good friend of mine. He runs a company in China called Shanghai Fruit Day. It's an online portal for rich people to buy fruit from around the world, only the rich. He has 300,000 users of his website, and he packages up his product so that it appeals to the ultra-rich premium consumer. This is the opportunity for us in Australia, this high-end market. Forget the food bowl, forget the middle class. They're good, but it's the premium market that we want. These are the people that pay $20 for a litre of milk. These are the people who will pay whatever it takes to get the highest class product. But we have to get really good at servicing that market. And we have a few challenges around that. Now, let's just think about the numbers. I mean, there's 100 billionaires and a million millionaires. I, I think those numbers are all understated, frankly. But I think what's most important is that this market is growing very quickly. Half of the Chinese who are wealthy today were not wealthy four years ago. And over half who will be wealthy are not wealthy today. So there's a very fast-growing number. And, that, and it's happening very quickly. And as you can see, a lot of them are actually planning to migrate as well, which creates another opportunity. The ultra-rich investor in China that I know the best is a chap called Dr. Chow. Now, Dr. Chow says, the trouble with you Australians is you're too egalitarian. You don't understand that as a rich person, we want something different. For example, when I play golf in Australia, I can't get a caddy, he says. No caddies in Australia. I'm sure you didn't have caddies yesterday. He wants a caddy. He wants to be treated as an ultra-rich person. But the trouble is, we say, carry your own bags, mate. You don't need a caddy. We have to get a lot better at looking after this group. We have to package better. We have to recognize them better. We have to understand the importance of hierarchy in Chinese culture. We have to recognize these people and service them really, really well. And they will pay four times, five times, ten times the price to get access to the highest quality product. And the more unique and the more exclusive and the harder it is to get, the more they will pay. And I think that's our big opportunity. So when you look at the numbers, they're just growing very quickly. We, if you look at the luxury goods market, that didn't really exist in 1995. Look at how China's luxury goods market has increased in the last 20 to 25 years compared to the rest of the world, which is generally shrinking. Um, when you look at that going forward into the future, um, in terms of luxury goods, uh, it's only going in one direction. And I always think if we're, if we're thinking about ultra-rich people, what are the sort of things that they might buy? which would be a good indicator of growth in the, uh, in the upper end market, not just handbags and, um, and watches. What other sort of products? Private jets? Beer? Beer. <laughs> Vehicles? What about yachts? What about yachts? Let's have a look at yachts. There's the uh, Chinese import of yachts just uh, in the last couple of years. This is a very fast-growing market. It might be a small percentage, but a small percentage of a billion people is a lot of people. It probably represents the population of Australia, just in this 
ultra-rich band of people. This premium consumer, that's the market. That's the market we should be going for. That's where I think the opportunity is. Another opportunity is around the, the growth in online in China, the, what we call the digital Silk Road. Um, Alibaba, I'm sure that's a name you've all heard of. They just listed it. The largest e-commerce e firm in the world just listed in the US for $22 billion. That's because the Chinese are going online rather than bricks and mortar. Jack Ma, who's the um, chairman of Alibaba, often says that in the West, uh, the main course is bricks and mortar, shop stores, retail environments, and online is the dessert. He says in China, online is the main course. Everyone goes online first. That's where they start. And when you look at the growth in terms of e-commerce sales, um, China is leading the world. It's, it's going to far exceed uh, the US. It means that actually you can enter the China market without a store, without even a presence in China. You can actually do it all online. Um, and that area is growing very quickly. As I said, my friend Lauren Zhao with Shanghai Fruit Day, from zero two or three years ago, they now have 300,000 customers all online, and there'll be half a million by the end of the next couple of years. So it's growing very quickly, this online area. Have a look at how you could distribute product online. I think you'll find that there's uh, some exciting opportunities there. So just a couple of things uh, before I finish, um, and then I'm, I'd love to take some questions about this. Just a couple of bits of advice from me. The first is this. There are 150,000 Chinese students in Australia. 150,000. Now, the, these are the products of a one-child family. So somewhere in China, a, a family has decided to send their precious one child not to America or England or Europe, but to Australia to do their studying. So at the end of their studies, they do very well, of course. Their English improves. Um, they get very high marks. They work very hard. At the end of their studies, they say, we'd love to get some work experience. And their parents encourage them to go and learn how the foreigners do business. So they put out their CV. They look for opportunities for work, internships, um, cadetships, um, apprentice apprenticeships. Um, and they get rejected routinely, always. And they end up going back to China into the family business. What a waste. 150,000 of these people. Not only do they work hard, and they could be your China customer relationships person and take the phone calls from the Chinese and build your networks and, and databases in China, but they also have rich parents who can help you in China, could open some doors, could be a government official or a CEO of a state-owned enterprise or an entrepreneur or a very rich person who could help you in China and open the door for you simply because you looked after their precious one child who was looking for a job and work experience in Australia. What a great opportunity. If that interests you, go and look at hirechinese.com.au, hirechinese.com.au, or Zukal, Z-O-O-K-A-L. These are friends of mine who've set up websites to try and help Australian employers find young Chinese students looking for work experience. And here's the, here's the rub. Most of them don't want to be paid. They just want the experience. They just want the experience. Give it to them. We've done that with the citrus industry. I'm very proud to say that I've introduced an intern program to the citrus industry, and now we're starting to see kids coming out of regional universities doing internships in citrus growers' offices. Not picking fruit, by the way, but sitting in the offices actually talking to Chinese customers in Chinese. Very helpful. Um, why don't you do that? Hirechinese.com.au. Have a look at that. And then finally, um, this is a slide that I keep thinking I really need to stop using. Um, and uh, it was, it, this picture was taken in 2008. So if you remember, this was the pinnacle of Kevin 07. So Kevin was elected in 07. So in 2008, he found himself outside the G8 meeting as an observer with the other countries who were observers. And in those days, it doesn't, it's not that long ago, if you think about it, China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, they were not members of the G8. They were all invited as observer, observers. Countries like Italy, France, Germany were all members, and these countries were excluded. So Kevin, at the 
having just been elected Prime Minister of Australia, and let me say that was the high point for us with China, to have a Mandarin-speaking Prime Minister, he found himself outside the G8 meeting with the President of China and the Prime Minister of India, both of whom didn't know each other very well and were quite shy and found it difficult to communicate because, of course, Hu Jintao didn't speak great English and Man Mahan Singh was a technocrat, not very easy. He found it very difficult socially. So Kevin, using his perfect diplomatic skills all those years in DFAT, the Prime Minister, newly elected of Australia, Mandarin speaking, using his well-polished Mandarin, found himself in this, with this opportunity to bring these two people together and help them make friends. When I saw this photograph, I thought, this is it. This is what Australia could be. Instead of being the white trash of Asia, we could step up, we could facilitate relationships between these ancient countries with all their civilizations and history and food and cultures, and we could bring them together and we could all make some money doing that. Now, I realize that it all went to shit after this photograph. <laughs> and this actually was the high point of Kevin 07. But for a, for, a, for a moment, for a gleaming moment, I thought, this is modern Australia. This is what we could be. So I would urge you all to look at this photograph and be like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you've got a question for David, please put your hand up and we will get a microphone to you. I am wondering, David, where did all this obscene wealth come from that these Chinese people have? Where did it come from and does it matter? <laughs> well, it came from foreign investment. So when China opened up in the 80s, um, as they did, Deng Xiaoping was the, the, the sort of founder of modern China. Uh, they opened up their economy and investment flooded in. And so as a result, the government had money to invest in projects, in developments, in property, in changing the environment. And many Chinese entrepreneurs got in on the back of that. And to, some of them no doubt paid money to have access. Some of them no doubt paid bribes. And they, maybe there was some things going on that in the West we don't necessarily approve of. But it works in China, or it did work. It's now, there's now a big crackdown. So in China, place. it's known as the cost of doing business. It was. It's now changed. Yeah. Um, but that's where the money came from. Question here in front. Uh, Don, where is the microphone? The speaking shout stick? It out, shout it out, Don. I can hear. Come on, Bob. You can run faster than that. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, David, just, you, you raised the question about Brand Australia, and that is a particular issue for our industry and one that's, um, in a sense, found its way into Senate reviews and all sorts of things, where we've promoted Brand Australia. Um, I have a view about having Brand Australia as an underpinning um, element of security and safety and cleanliness and all the things you talked about. Some people see it as diminishing the value of an independent brand. Um, could you just comment a little bit more on that? I think it's probably the, the significant thing that resonated with me. Yeah. I think that there may be a case for building your individual brand with the importers, the wholesalers the people who are, who are placing the orders. And of course, that's probably where the greatest competition exists, so that um, you make sure that uh, your, your, the importers understand why your brand is different and your product is different, and you can build that value proposition at the sort of import level. But on the shop floor, when it comes to the consumer looking at the product on the shelf, that's where the Made in Australia brand has to be. Mm -hmm. And I've seen many examples of where it doesn't exist. I think uh, Barnaby Joyce made that point uh, just at the weekend as well, that Brand Australia is the predominant brand. Bryce, you've got somebody down there? Yep. David, Carl Graves here. David, uh, just throwing the question out to, to you, uh, you threw the carrot out there as saying, you know, we need to consolidate as a beef industry, I suppose, as a whole. Um, with your experience through the, through the citrus uh, side of the industry, how, how would you suggest we, we uh, consolidate and move forward? Thanks for the question. Good. So in the citrus area, and I can't comment, I won't comment on the beef area in case I upset anyone, there's a lot of old people uh, looking to get out of the industry. So if a, if a Chinese guy turns up at their gate and offers them $10 million, they'll say, thanks very much, I'll take that. 
It's the younger ones where I see the opportunity. So I think, to, you know, to answer your question, it's the next generation that need to get involved now. Because this is a 20 to 30 year wave, and it's not a two or three year wave. So my view is, for what it's worth, and, and this is starting to happen in other sectors, is to get the younger generation together, build a, a group, start talking to each other about how you can aggregate and consolidate with a view to attracting investment from China. Because as I say, the China will bring the money, they'll bring the money in the market, we've got the products and the know-how, there's huge expertise here in this room, we need to have a five-year plan like the Chinese do, um, and I would suggest that it's the younger generation that needs to play, play a strong role in this. There is a, an undertone running through the country of fear of Chinese investment. It's almost like there's a fear of a takeover. They're taking our land. They're, good. They're going to take our food back to China when the excrement makes contact with the air circulation system. That all this food's going to leave Australia. That we're actually reducing our own capacity to look after ourselves. What would you say to those people? Well, there's some challenges. For example, you know, we're at, at a local domestic level, we're seeing prices going you know, down, down, down. Um, and China saying, we want to pay more and more and more. So at some point, there will be this kind of confluence where producers will start saying, well, I've got a very tight domestic market versus a quite lucrative overseas market. And I suppose if you play that out, maybe we're going to have problems domestically. I think we've got a long way to go before we need to worry about that. Indeed. We have a question coming in on text. How does uh, brand Australia compare to brand US or brand Brazil? Um, how do we rate? Well, we rate really well. Um, the, the, we've, never, we've never upset the Chinese. We've never invaded them. We've never taken any of their land away. They don't see us as arrogant. They see us as quite friendly, actually. I, I think brand Australia would stack up really well against most of those brands, particularly Brazil and certainly the US. I think we can compete very well if we compete as brand Australia. Um, so um, from my experience walking around China, Australia is always very highly regarded and many of them want to live, be educated, get healthcare, tourism and other things in Australia. We're going to see a lot more of it in the future. David, thank you so much for your insights. Are you, are you waiting around for the next couple of days? Are you today, here? I'm here today. Just yeah. today. Yeah. Go pick his brain during the breaks and please say thanks to David Thomas. Great, thank you. Thanks, Mike.